Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Barnes, Professor of Business Management here at Lakeland Community College, and I'd like to welcome you all tonight and thank you for coming to the Dworkin and Bernstein Management Lecture Series at Lakeland Community College. The series is brought to you through the endowment of the Dworkin and Bernstein Law Firm. Uh, this is the Spring 2019 series. Our speaker tonight is Eileen Bewley, President of BevCore LLC. Eileen Bewey, Bewley is the president of BevCore since 2017. It's a North American-based company that provides fillers, blenders, seamer, seamers, and handling equipment for high-speed food and beverage producers. They're headquartered in Willoughby, Ohio. BevCore is known in the industry for being a leader in reliability and is fully committed to improving customer productivity. BevCorp does this by levering application and design expertise, customer orientation, service and parts capabilities while maintaining a small company feel. Eileen graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in Spanish and political science. And that may be something interesting to find out how you become a president of a manufacturing company when, when that is your background. She completed her master's in applied behavioral science from Antioch University. She's worked in packaging equipment for over 25 years in divisions of the global companies Closure Systems International, which was previously Alcoa, and Ingersoll Rand. She's an impassioned linguist. She speaks fluent Spanish and German and dabbles in Russian, Mandarin, and Portuguese and any other language she has a chance to learn. She's a world traveler, enamored by culture and customs. She's a fitness enthusiast and is interested in mentoring young people through work and general life and events, and most of all, in the health and happiness of her family, including her four grandchildren. She lives in Mayfield Heights, and I'd like you all to help me welcome Eileen Bewley, president of BevCorp LLC. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thanks Excellent. for having me here. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and to get to meet some local folks here in Ohio that are involved in their own path and their own journey of learning and exploring and finding out what waits ahead for you. So thanks for um, letting me talk with you on this beautiful day where your grass is so green outside. I think we should just take this outside, really. I think that would be a good idea. Um, so I, ca I came to um, Willoughby in August of 2017, and it's been an exciting journey to be here. And I love the company BevCorp and the folks. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I, I'd like to share with you kind of really how I got here. And um, it is quite a journey, and I think that you all will experience, or you'll, you'll connect, you'll kind of connect um, the dots that don't look like normal dots, maybe, like not an engineering degree. Um, I was the oldest child of four, and we're pretty well spaced apart. My youngest brother's about uh, seven or eight years younger than I am. And we grew up uh, in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, our dad um, worked at RCA, so RCA is, used to be, back in the heyday, they were making these TVs left and right, and when they went to color TVs, it was like it was super cool, so production was very, very heavy, and Bloomington was flourishing with RCA, and we lived um, two miles from RCA. I mean, I was like this size and would come home from school and we would stay at a babysitter until my dad got home. And because my mom worked part time, she was a nurse. And uh, my dad ran to work with a lunch pail and then he ran home. Like, who does that? There were no sidewalks back in the 60s um, on the roads and nobody ran because everybody had cars. And People at his work, you know, they, caught, they thought he was a little eclectic. I was embarrassed. I would be like, oh my gosh, if my friends see him running on the road, like I'm just, you know, I'm just gonna die. Um, because it wasn't a popular thing to do. And um, my dad always said, well, you need to get your fitness in somehow. And why waste another car? You know, seriously, why have a car to drive two miles? 
he was a fitness enthusiast before he started working. He had been in a farm before he started working in production. So he had the freedom to move around. He loved running. And so he carried that with him. And at the time, all I saw was embarrassment. And in fact, until this morning, I really didn't connect how much of an impact that made on my life to say, it's okay to be different. Well, dad didn't keep the running just to himself. We were four, four kids and the youngest was about this size when we, um, we were taken to the city track um, teams and we, we, were, we were all four enrolled um, in, in, a track, um, in a track team and we all four had to participate. And one year, I remember, I was like, I was fourth or fifth grade and um, we were in the city meet and I only used to do one or two events because I wasn't really good. I just, I ran slow, but I ran. And it was tied. And so um, it was tied and the coach, um, we had the half mile to go. That was like the last event. It was the longest event. And, um, and they, the other team didn't have any girls that could run a half mile. And so the, the coach was like really smart. And he goes, okay, well, I've got her left over. I know she can do it. I never, ran, I never run a 440, I don't think. So he said, all you have to do is run around the track twice. And we're going to have you run it with the boys because there's no other girls. And we're not going to make the parents wait around while you're running this thing by yourself. So I ran with the five guys that were competing for first place. And I was well behind them. And I could hear my dad, who was on the other side of the track, yelling, get out there, you can beat that boy. So, no, no, no. <laughs> so that is not what drove me to get into manufacturing by any means. But what that drove me to do was to finish the race and to help our team win. And it was, it was pretty cool to have that support and somebody to push you to persevere even when you're doing something that you've never done before. So you kind of look at back at your life and you look at where you are now and you think about what are, what are some things that you've learned through school that people have encouraged you to do in spite of you thinking that maybe you couldn't do it. So, anyway, it's okay. And then um, our parents, uh, we all had to learn a musical instrument. So I picked piano because I thought, well, that's just the easiest. And so I did, I did piano. And um, growing up in IU, um, so Bloomington, has anybody seen the movie, um, the bike movie? Does anybody know? Breaking, Breaking Away? Does anybody remember that? Yay! Whoa! Two extra cookies. Yay! Three extra cookies. So I, I grew up at the time that that movie was being, actually I got to watch them film the food fight. That was really cool because I was working in the library at the time on campus. But that was kind of like what Bloomington, Indiana was like. There were the townies and there, there was the college and the college was very liberal arts, full of really good music professionals. So we all um, had the experience of getting good musical training from these very very good musicians, but it was hard. And it was like, it would get really boring practicing the same scales over and over again. But it was another lesson of perseverance that our parents um, taught all of us. And the cool outcome of that, as I look at my grandchildren now, my oldest is playing the violin and, and playing it with the little ones and letting them experience the joy of music. So um, yeah, it's a, um, Perseverance was a message that was loud and clear through my entire little childhood without being aware. So growing up in Bloomington, um, the other thing about a, a liberal arts school, so there's a business school there too. There's about like 30,000 students and it's changed somewhat over time, but it's still about a, it's about a mix, about half and half, half townies and half, half college. Um, and we would have a lot of international students, a lot of international students at our, at our campuses. And our, and our church uh, encouraged us to invite um, students to our house, like for, for the holidays, because they didn't have a place to go. The international students, you know, they're kind of stuck eating the dorm food at Thanksgiving or, you know, Christmas. So we always, it just was just the way it was. We always had an international student at the table with us. So they got to experience Southern Indiana cooking and Southern Indiana families and lots of kids. And so we got to experience and learn a lot about the world. And again, I was little, I didn't know anything different. You know, it's like, okay, what country are we gonna get for Christmas this year? You know, it was just kind of, it was normal for us. And it was pretty, it was pretty cool. And um, by the time I got to high school, we'd been exposed to a lot of different countries. And that's when I started picking up Spanish. And then 
learned that um, I had an affinity for languages and, and um, I, would, I would take more languages in high school so I didn't have to take math and um, just load up with the credits and, and, and get more A's and it helped improve the GPA. So I, I learned what a strategy was at a young age, right, without even knowing what a strategy was. So um, upon completing um, high school, I'm going to tie you the first year, and then um, they had a foreign exchange program where we could go to different countries. And, and so as a Spanish, <coughs> excuse me, as a Spanish student, you could pick um, from Spain or Peru. And this was in the time, this was like late 70s, so there was a military regime um, running Peru. And they had this thing called toque de queda, which was like you had to be in your house by 10 o'clock at night. If you live there, you were going to be shot. So it was that kind of, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I've got to go there. I can always go to Europe. Like when I get old, I can always go to Europe, but I'm going to go to Peru now. So, so I, I picked Peru, and, and, and they kind of they interrogate you for the exchange program, um, especially like Peru, because they, they kind of were like, you know, you're a girl, and like, you know, it's kind of dangerous. And I said, yeah, I know, but I speak the language. It's going to be okay. So, so the cool thing is I got to spend a year there and we, um, we had total immersion. You lived with a family and studied all the classes in Spanish with um, professors from the local Catholic university. And um, we had a person that would help us, like a bilingual person that would help us with our papers because we had to write all our papers in Spanish and turn them in. And so she became our mentor. And that was the first time I had a, a real mentor. And she was a single mom, and her dad worked for the UN, and she, she was just super cool. And she challenged us and encouraged us, and um, it taught me, it exposed me at that age about how important it was to have somebody that could help you along your path and just kind of open, open your eyes to slightly different things and help, help uh, encourage you when you were having a hard time. So, um, I think now, as I look back on that, I think, wow, I wanted to be like her then, and I want to be like her now, because I want to help other, other folks that are going through, through their school and, and having questions about what next and, and how, to, how to make it through that. So that was that. Was that. So after, after my sophomore year, I came back to Bloomington for just a little bit, and then um, was married and my, my husband joined the military. So I needed to transfer over <coughs> to Germany because that's where he was assigned. And um, in the military at that time, the University of Maryland had a really good program connected um, in Heidelberg, in Heidelberg, Germany. So I got the opportunity to learn German. I started learning German on the streets. So I would go up to the bakery and go, was ist das und was ist das und wie viel kostet das? And I had no idea what they answered back, but I just talked. So. So then eventually I would repeat what they would say and I started learning it and then I started studying the German actually in the university. We were there for um, two and a half years, almost, almost three years. So I had my first daughter, my daughter there. She was three months old when I graduated from university over in Heidelberg. And then it was, um, it was a great opportunity. I got to see Europe, right? Didn't think, I didn't worry about it and, and it happened before finishing school. So I majored in Spanish and political science. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it because I didn't get a teaching certificate. <coughs> it would have been more, more hours and I wanted to get my studies done because now I had a little baby and I was like, I don't want to have this lingering out there. I just have to get this done and I'll figure it out from there. So I always had an interest in the UN. I always had an interest in um, the Peace Corps because I like giving and helping to people. And at that time, Noriega was the thing in Nicaragua, and so I also had this excite, exciting thought about being with the CIA. So I investigated that, kind of applied with that, and I thought, I thought it would be really cool to take my little daughter. We could go down to Nicaragua and run a little yarn shop, and nobody would have a clue that, you know, I was with the CIA because I just didn't look the type. But, um, but then practicality kind of set back in, and I was like, okay, well, I guess it's time to go back to the States, and um, my husband finished his career up with the military. And then, um, and then it's kind of like, okay, well now, you know, now what do we do? So we moved, we moved to Indiana to a small town called Crawfordsville. And um, I started supporting the schools, the local college there. I was a debate coach and a part-time um, teacher. And then that's kind of like really where my life changed. Um, my neighbor came over one day 
and she said, hey, we're moving our international customer service from Reno, Nevada to Crawfordsville. We need you to come work in customer service. And I said, what's that? She said, well, we make these machines that make, we make these machines that make um, feed for animals and we have to sell the parts to the customers and the machines and, and we have customers all over the world and we need somebody that can do that. And I was like, well, what? Like work in an office? Like work in a plant? Like what? And so anyway, I was one of maybe a dozen people that spoke Spanish in the town of 13,000 and um, the pay was obviously better than a part-time debate coach, so my, bo my, my boss, oh, that was a slip, my, my husband at the time, sorry, I really didn't mean to do that. My, my husband encouraged me to go do it. He said, this is, this is a good opportunity. I really didn't have interest because I didn't know what it was, but I just gave it a try. So I went in and interviewed for the position and spoke in Spanish and learned a little bit about it. I didn't understand what they were you know, really talking about, um, but we just talked about, talked about, people and how many people they had in the department and kind of what, what people needed to do in order to help the customers. And um, I got the position. So all of a sudden my life changed. We moved to this tiny town and I'm gonna work in a big company called Ingersoll Rand. And, um, and I really still didn't know really what that meant. So the night before my first day on the job, my supervisor called and she said, hey, we had this thing happened. The plant went on strike. And I said, okay. And she said, well, so we need you to come in tomorrow, but like just with old clothes and old shoes and make sure your toes are covered. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And she said, we all need to work in the plant because we need to make product. And I said, okay. And she said, and, and we're going to work 12 hours a day. Um, and then we're going to see if we can catch up on the production and maybe we'll back it down to 10. I mean, this is at nine o'clock at night before my first day working for Ingersoll Rand. I'm like, okay. So it was kind of, uh, as I look back, uh, a real exposure to change on the fly. You know, I think I'm gonna be going in and I'm gonna be learning how to operate a thing. Guys, these things sound like they came from a museum, but a telex machine, it was before we had computers, we had automatic typewriters, we had telex machines. So I go in with dirty old clothes and old shoes and, um, I'm the newbie, I hadn't met anybody other than like my supervisor and one other person. And so, um, because I'm a newbie, I get the first job of utility. So what that means is I take a little shovel and go by every machine that is making these dyes. So I'll tell you just a little bit about the machines so you can envision this. These pellet mills are machines that make feed for animals. They have a mixer, so for the techie people, they have a, a machine that mixes the feed, and then, then they, they feed it in, they add some steam and stuff, and they get this feed for animals ready. And then they have a machine that's kind of like one of those Play-Doh extruders that you had as a kid. The food goes through there, the dye and the roll squish the food out of the dye, and then these little knives chop off the pellets. And then, then our customers, who were the people that made the food, like Cargill, would put them in bags or whatever and sell, sell the product to feed for animals, um, poultry and, and cows. And everyone is different because the size of pellets are different. So we made these dyes, they're these big round things. They weigh about 220 pounds up to 300 and they're on this auto dye, this auto drill machine. And they make a lot of shavings on the ground in, in the plant. So my responsibility was to shovel the shavings and put them in a wheelbarrow and take it back to the trailer and you dump it in the trailer and you just do it all over again. And then I got pretty good at that and the floors were pretty clean and I took it really serious because I didn't know any different. I was like, okay, I gotta make sure this floor is clean. And then um, over time I got to clean the heat treat machines and so my name became Pigpen because you opened the lid and you had to kind of clean them and it was like covered literally like Pigpen. But at the same time we had customers calling and wanting their product. But I really didn't know a lot about what I was selling or what they wanted or what they needed, but I could talk to them in Spanish. So I talked to them on Spanish and answering the phone and answering the phone and jotting down what they wanted and then grabbing the first guy I could get in a machine. And I got pretty good at figuring out who knew what they were talking about. I didn't know what they were talking about, but I could just tell. I began to become intuitive, whether it was trial and error a couple of times, I was like, this guy really doesn't know what he's talking about, I'm gonna try this one. So I tell him the problem, I translate it from Spanish, I tell him this guy says, this part on his machine is down. And then they would start, they would start drawing it out, telling me this is what he needs. So I would run back to the phone and I would call the customer back and say, this is what you need, blah, 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 blah. And still, and figure out how to process these orders and do letters of credit, literally 
on the fly while the plant is on strike and all the managers that know what to do and normally tell you what to do are out in the shop running the machines because they're not in utility. So this went on for over a month until finally the, the strike reached an agreement and everybody moved into their old, into the offices. And then I, I started really truly kind of learning about business by doing. And so what I learned about myself was that that's how I learn best. Like you can tell me something, I can hear it for a second, you know, or I can read it, but I really get it when I do it. So it was, it was a good experience. You take something like that, say, hey, this strike was really good because I just got thrown in, immersed, and, and I learned by doing. And so once again, being exposed to change, it requires you to adapt, adapt from working in the shop to the office and back and forth. And, um, and, and, and the more you adapt, the easier it gets to adapt. It's not always easy. And there's always going to be a point where I, I think we all get challenged and we're stuck in our way. It doesn't matter if we're 20. It doesn't matter if we're 60. It's going to happen to the most versatile of all of us. So we need to be mindful of that. We need to be able to trust folks around us to be able to walk and walk through it. Um, so that was, that was the experience at Ingersoll Rand. They, um, they moved me to New Hampshire because we had a facility up in New Hampshire. So we got to live up there for a year and experience all the seasons it's very has anybody been to new hampshire Maybe. yeah yeah it's very pretty really really beautiful place and then um there i got to experience um, running running an assembly facility for a little bit did master scheduling um, that's when you make sure that all the parts for a machine are ready to go and then um after that then they moved me to kansas independence kansas has anybody been to independence kansas Whoa, hey, <laughs> what'd you think of Independence, Kansas? Actually nice down there. It is, right? It's really, it's really a nice, quaint town. It's really, it's really cool. It's got a lot of influence from the old oil industry down there. So it's, it's really, really neat. So I spent a year there, and then Ingersoll Rand moved me back to Indiana. When I, when I was in Kansas, I was now a single mom. I had a um, two-year-old son, and my daughter was in third grade. And so I was trying to balance balance work and life at that point. And um, when I had the opportunity to move back to Indiana, um, where my, my family was, having the support network there was important and a, and a critical reason to move back. So I did that. And then um, ran their international customer service. And then, um, then one day I got a phone call and um, a lady from Alcoa called me. Does anybody know Alcoa? Aluminum Corporation of America. There's a lot in Pittsburgh, right? Um, in 1986, Alcoa, they used to make aluminum caps. So those roll-on caps that go on glass bottles was the primary, you know, and you screw them off, but they go on and they're formed. So anyway, that's what they did, but they saw the future was gonna be plastic. And they found this rinky-dink little company in Crawfordsville, Indiana, that had developed a technology called rotary compression equipment that would make plastic bottle caps and they had the design so Alcoa bought this little company and they were in the process of integrating it into Alcoa's way but the company was growing very fast at the same time because Coke and Pepsi started switching their their caps to these plastic ones at that time they thought plastic was really cool um, you know the the roll-on ones sometimes can can hurt your hands you know they're rough and there was probably some material reason too, you know, the commodity, the plastic versus the aluminum, I don't know all the reasons, but Coke and Pepsi were gonna be using those and they were gonna be expanding globally. So Alcoa decided that anywhere Coke and Pepsi were gonna go in the world, they were gonna go. So what that meant is they would first seed the, um, the industry with the bottle caps and then they would put a plant in those countries. So Alcoa bought this little company called HC or see it later CSI and they started expanding so this lady called me um, and said she had heard about me from my freight forwarder and from a guy at church who happened to work at this company I, I didn't know Alcoa then I had no idea 
And they said they were expanding and they wanted to talk to me because they needed, they needed somebody with my profile. And I was like, I don't know what my profile is. We didn't profile back then. We didn't do profiling, except the FBI maybe did. I don't know. But um, so I met, I met the lady for lunch and we started talking and they were expanding. They were going into Germany. They were going into South America. They were going into Russia. And my, light, my eyes lit up. I was going, hmm, maybe I can learn another language. So um, they talked about what they needed. They needed somebody to run customer service and make the machines that were going to be shipped to these other countries, train the people who were going to be operating these machines in these other countries, and set up their inventory and their warehouses and stuff. And I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. So after you know, a number of years with Ingersoll Rand, I left and I went to Alcoa in Crawfordsville, Indiana. So we started our journey and we started making machines and we were capable of making about like 10 machines a year and we went to 60 machines a year, six zero. And um, we started expanding first in South America. That's where we were going. It's like early 90s by this time. And um, starting to ship, we started opening plants in Colombia and Chile, uh, in Argentina, those are the first, in Brazil. And I kind of quickly realized our staff that we had running our customer service, um, they knew about bottle caps because we had hired them from the manufacturing facility. Alcoa was great about promoting from within, but they didn't, they didn't know geography. And um, they got the countries confused and we were shipping these parts and they were supposed to go to Colombia and they shipped them to, to Chile and they were like, well, they both start with a C and I don't know. And I mean, this is a true story. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get the shipping department to like, not make these kind of mistakes. And so um, I decided that I would get some, some colored dots. And so I got red dots for Chile, blue dots for Colombia. We gave a color for every country and we made the folders because we had to have paper then to ship everything. And so the folders matched the dots and the dots went on the right box and the boxes started going to the right countries. Until one day, Lisa, who was in charge of this, came to me and she was like seriously worried. She goes, Eileen, we have run out of colors and Bahrain is up next. I took her black folder, I turned it inside out and it was gray and said, Bahrain is now gray. And when you go back to this plant in, in Crawfordsville today, the folders, they still have the folders. They, they still kept the same. This is something that's taught in um, operations and in lean management, but if you don't have that knowledge, you just gotta, gotta lean into creativity and figure out a way to make it happen. So we had lots of adventures like that. Um, and then we had a lot of learnings of some things that you know, could go wrong if you don't have the training properly documented and you don't have people walking side by side as they're opening these facilities. And a lot can go wrong through translation. We opened, um, we opened a plant in Korea and in China, and we were really having a hard time with inventory and um, people really understanding the process. So before we did um, Russia, I talked to my boss and I said, hey, I'd really like to learn the language and I think I can really bridge that, that gap we have. So she sent me to Berlitz. Has anybody heard of Ber Berlitz, the Berlitz program? Yeah, so it's one-on-one -on -one immersion uh, in language and I got the fantastic opportunity with, with Alcoa to study Russian and completed a year of the, of the program and really quite fluent, um, not fluent now, but uh, quite fluent at the time. And um, so my mission was to go over there before we started the plant and help set up the inventory and to talk to the people in, in, at, at the inventory department and, and get all that set up. But a super cool gift was like given to me and other people that when we went over, it was the 850th birthday of Moscow and it was at the time where things were changing. So this was, I think this was like 1995. And um, people were now being able to talk to people from the West. People were developing things over there. And so we, we got to hang out in Moscow. We got to go to St. Petersburg and we got to talk to people on the streets because I learned the language. So we, we would sit on the park corners and, and um, talk with folks, people with their kids, people with situations. I'll never forget a couple that the guy was originally from Georgia and his wife was from St. Petersburg and the mother-in-law was like really flipped out that she married somebody from Georgia. And I really remember at that moment, it's like we all have the same challenges and opportunities. You know, we just need a way to, to share. So it was really, really a fascinating time to be over there and to, to make good friends and to connect with a lot of people. So that's kind of um, where, where I was with Alcoa. We, we expanded across the globe, everywhere where Coke and Pepsi went. We pretty much 
I think we got to 30 some plants at one point in time because those markets were growing. You know, CSD had been a, CSD is carbonated soft drinks. It had been a standard part of everybody's diet around here for quite a while, but it was really growing in these markets. It continued to grow in Mexico. We had like three plants in Mexico. And um, so, you know, it was continuing to grow through that time. Um, and then in the late 90s, I switched to another division to have a different opportunity. And I ran the sales and service in the packaging industry. And so that's where we begin to connect the dots um, with BevCorp. So the packaging industry is the other side. So you take the bottle caps and you put those on the, on the, on the, machine, on the package. So take the bottle cap, put it on the bottle. Take the bottle cap, put it on the bottle, except you do it like a thousand a minute. So you try to kind of picture how fast that can go and how precise it needs to go. So Alcoa also made the machines to put the bottle caps on. It could be on glass, could be on plastic, could be on different size packages. And um, at the time that I took that position, they had just obsoleted one of the old, what they called a tank, a machine that was very robust, but it had a big long lead time because it was a casting, and decided to, without fully testing through a nice robust R&D program, design the machine in Germany with guys who had never seen how the lines in the US run and ship the machines over and expect them to start up and be plug and play. The day, the day I started, the customers were absolutely furious because parts were falling off of the machines. They were literally flying off. When they were trying to apply the bottle caps, the headsets were like flying off the machines because the design was not robust enough for the market that they put it in. So we spent quite a bit of time customer managing, you know, sending people all over the country to help manage this handful of machines that had been prematurely released into the marketplace. And learning again, like on the fly, um, how these machines operate, what, you know, what the customers need. We had, we had that year, we had $4 million in warranty that we had to manage and make sure that we made our customers' machines right. And then we had to figure out what we were gonna do because uh, uh, at that point, we, I put a stake in the ground and said, we're not gonna sell these machines to these customers. That's not the right thing to do. So that was um, actually my first experience with um, running a skunk's work project. Does anybody know what a skunk's work project is? Have you heard of those? Anybody in technical, raise your hand, have you heard of that? Um, we had our field service engineers were pretty mad because they knew they had a product that they could take care of their customers with before. And what happened is um, they, let's go back just a second here. They, um, they were really mad, they were mad. Why do I have to put my face to a product that's not working right? And so they kind of got together for dinner one, one night and they had a new design that they were laying out on napkins. That's some of the best designs as, as any of you engineers know, come from a napkin. So we, I didn't run engineering at the time, so we just took the service guys and, and took them off site and in my backyard and you know the deck and started kind of designing a machine that would work for this market, taking a variation of the theme of the old machine. And when they had that ready, we didn't tell anybody when they had it ready, I took it to my boss, I said, this is what we need to use. These guys designed it, they know the customers, they know what they need. We need to, we need to introduce this platform, lower lead time, fits the market needs. So it was a great product. Our bosses were happy, our customers were happy, but our engineers that were not involved in the Skunks Work project were kind of frustrated. They were kind of pouty. They didn't get the opportunity to put their mark on it. And, and so no matter how good of a product you have, my, my lesson there was we, we need to figure out the right way to integrate people and get people involved so that they feel like it's theirs. Is there an engineer sitting over there someplace? <laughs> Any engineers in the room? A lot of engineers, right? I want to talk to you during the cookie break and, and see the best, a better way that we could have maybe done that. The, gr the great thing is we got a good product. It works. It's still the industry standard for Alcoa today. So the good thing is they solved it. But it was, an ex it was once again an opportunity to deal with and adapt to change and, and to teach other people to adapt to change. Okay, so... Um, Christine asked me to talk about like, like what I value and, and basically what's important to me personally and then also kind of at work like what's important to me 
for team members at BevCorp or anywhere I work. And um, I say day in and day out, safety without a stop. Safety is the most important thing. Safety for ourselves, for our families, for our customers, that is the most important thing. And I learned that from Paul O'Neill in 1992 when I started at Alcoa because he was in a transformation time with Alcoa. They had had a lot of fatalities and it was not acceptable. And when he, when he came into Alcoa as, as the leader, he made it a point to let all of the plants know that that was his number one priority. And he invested time and people and talent until the culture changed. And the culture did transform. I saw it kind of at the beginning. I saw it happening in front of me. So, so when, I came, when I came to Willoughby, um, I did see an opportunity. We had great policies and procedures in place. Um, and I also saw that we had a lot of room to grow. So I spent a lot of my time um, I think my boss was a little bit like surprised because, you know, he knew that I knew customers and relationships and people and everything. And he, he kind of was surprised that that was the most important thing to me. But he's been very supportive and we've truly um, built on a great system and made it even better because it's not OK for any of our folks to go home. And we all own safety. So it's not just me. It's not just the safety manager, it's not just the supervisor of the area, it's all of us. And, and that's something really neat that we've seen change a lot in BevCore the past, over the past year. Um, the next thing is people, and, and I alluded to that in the beginning, that um, that is like, aside from making sure everybody is safe, that is the most joyous part of my job, is to be able to develop people and expose them. Just like that mentor in Lima, Peru, helped develop me into a linguist and have ex experiences because I spoke languages, my job and my joy comes from developing others. And to see them latch onto a new job or want to grow or learn or to try to get better and to take on new responsibilities and to be able to support them and, and you can do this. It is the most joyous part of, of my day. And um, something else that goes along with that is to help people see the strengths in their, in their peers. So we, we encourage others to find somebody, it's like, so okay, I'm really not very good at turning the wrench. I can do it, I've rebuilt headsets, but I'm not very good at it. So I'll go get um, somebody in the shop that knows how to do that. And conversely, if they need something typed up, I will help them type it up. Um, whatever it is, recognize the strength in, in your peers and really, really leverage that. Um, customers, I know you'll get a chance to talk to one of my coworkers here at the end and um, he, he'll probably, validate that I'm pretty passionate about customers and um, what they need matters. They are why we are here at whatever we do. The customers are the reason why we are here. We need to listen to them. We need to ask clarifying questions and we need to meet their needs. So that's, uh, that's a very, very strong driven um, uh, value for me. So um, somewhere along the way in Alcoa, one of my one of my coworkers developed this five F's. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take um, credit for it. So it was just kind of an easy way to remember balance in life, and just five F's: faith, family, fellowship, friends, fitness, fun, food. Gets it, to get to six, it just kind of is an easy way for me to kind of think: is, is life getting a little out of balance? Because it can. You know, there are different times in in your life that um, you know things get a little bit a little bit kind of kind of out of control. So dialing it back in and remembering, and I believe in having fun at work. And I think a lot of our, a lot of our coworkers do the same. So that, that's important to me. So what do I look for in um, team members? You know that to me it's important to be adaptable. It's important to persevere. It's important to be creative and to look for alternative solutions. Um, it's also, when, when I first meet potential team members, the passion and the energy. We don't need everybody to be like super hyper, but you, you can feel that somebody has a fire in the belly, that they care, that they're genuinely curious and interested, and um, that they're going to invest themselves, whatever that is. They're gonna take the time to learn the job. They're gonna be curious. Um, teamwork is extremely important. Our customers, so I'm gonna divert for a second here, and and um, mention one of our customers um, 
uh, Keurig Dr. Pepper, it's okay to say this because it's public knowledge, they, they were about 4,500 employees and they did an acquisition, they bought Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper is like 20,000 people. So you talk about being in an environment, imagine you worked for Keurig, you went in the office every day in Boston, you're like focused on coffee, and the next thing you know, you come in, well, we just bought a beverage company, a cold fill beverage company with 20,000 people. What are we gonna do with all these people? How are we gonna integrate? How do we go to market? How do we do things together? They were introduced to tons of change. And I heard their CEO last week talk, Bob, and um, teamwork, although it's a very simple message, it's critically important. So how we work together instead of against each other is absolutely critical. And um, I believe that as well. Uh, collaborative, that goes along with teamwork. And then um, being open-minded, that goes along with being creative. So listening to the ideas of others. And um, you know, there, there may be something, a variation on a theme that may take your project to the next level, whatever that may be. So those are, those are a lot of things we look for. And we have a lot of that, and I'm happy to see that. We also like humility. I believe it's very important. Um, for us to not rest on our laurels so much that that's when the competition can get you. You know, if you're not constantly humble and hungry for new opportunities, you turn around and it's like, oh my gosh, what happened to my market share? So it's very, very important. Um, I'm gonna start talking a little bit about BevCorp because that's the, um, that's the that's the company right here around the corner, Willoughby. So this is just a really cool story. Um, BevCorp was, um, just before I started, it was founded by a couple here in Willoughby in 1992, and they still work here today. It was later bought by a large conglomerate out of Japan who, who is our parent company, but this couple still works there today because it's very important to them, our mission to be a full service provider, and that means knowing the equipment, supporting it, providing you parts, um, high speed packaging equipment. What that means is like super fast, like 2,000 cans a minute, 1,000, 1,200 bottles a minute going round and round and getting filled. And we provide the parts, the service, the product, the know how, um, and, and tons of technical support 24 7. So, our locations, our primary location, our founding location is Willoughby, um, right off of Euclid, very close to Chick fil A, if you know where Chick fil A is. And that's where we also we have our filling and handling division. Handling, um, I'll go into in just a second, but you think about what it is. It handles the bottle or it ha handles the can. We also have a division in Kennesaw, Georgia. It's about 40 minutes out of the Atlanta um, airport. And they do the blending equipment. And then we have the newest, the acquisition we did last March, is in Forest Hill, which is about an hour from the um, Baltimore airport. It's way out in the country. Very small seeming division. We're now over 200 employees, 205 actually, and we have over 50 service techs, people that travel all over the states and occasionally to Mexico, 50. Um, you know, I mentioned the co-founders. Our roots really are being a full stop service provider. We are about service. We're a small shop. Um, mentality, a mom and pop shop. We, we jump through hoops for our customers, and I mean literally jump. Johnny, who runs our production facility, he's been known to, if a customer calls and they're down, we will do what it takes. He's been known to take parts off a new machine we're building to get another customer up and running because they're down. And when they're down, um, if we have mathematicians in here, you think about a thousand bottles a minute or two thousand cans a minute, and they're running 20 hours a day, that's a lot of product they're missing. And new products like Monster and Bang and Rockstar and beer are a lot more expensive than water or, or uh, Coca-Cola. So if they're not running that product, they're losing a lot of money. So their downtime is critical to them. And, and it is to us too, we respect that and we do what it takes to get them running. Um, and then the other thing that's really important about our equipment is building flexibility in the, in the equipment. Equipment's hard, it, it, you know, it stands there, it, it's not flexible like putty, but um, we need to build flexibility in there so that if they want to run a package this big one day and a package this big the next day, they can change that machine in a heartbeat. And a heartbeat means less than 10 minutes, change an entire line, it means like, depalletizers and all this, all this crazy stuff that we can talk about later too. But flexibility is critical. And with somebody like Dr. Pepper, who has a gazillion flavors and different size 
you know, the new, the cans are now sleek, they call them sleek and slim and tall and short and stubby. There's just all kinds of packages. They need flexibility. They, you talk about change, what those folks go through day in and day out. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the equipment. Here you'll see a filler. The filler is a round machine. We have safety guarding around it. We've taken the original platforms and we continue to enhance them with new technology. Um, I created a word called it, we HGTV it. We take your machine and we modernize it. We add features that make it more adaptive to the market we're in today because the products, if you think about bottles that you see, bottles were very, very heavy in glass before. So the way you handle them and the way you fill them were different than the way we fill these flimsy, you know, those Nestle bottles you can just like crunch in your, in, in your non-dominant hand. Um, and so we've, we've adapted the equipment a lot for that. We've added more and more electronics to our equipment. And so that's a big deal to us as we look at skill sets. We look at people with mechanical and electrical expertise. And that's changed tremendously over the past 20 years. Um, and and we, we, our primary competitors in this high speed are European companies in Germany and Italy. And um, we by far have the most inventory because of our gracious Japanese investors um, here locally. And we are the quickest to jump through hoops when the customers need it. So it's clear to them that our advantage is having service and parts available. Whereas our European competitors, longer lead times, longer vacations. So if, you, if you're all about the vacation, you know, go to Italy, work there. But our customers are happy with our service. Um, the next product line is called the handling. This is what I call the handling division. So on the far right hand side, you can see a thing, it's a cart and it has these different parts that you, it's almost like snap on, snap off. You snap these parts on between machines that fill and close the package. So these parts hold, they carry the package, whether it's a can or a bottle, they hold, they hold the package and carry it through. That's why it's called handling equipment. It changes a ton too. The marketing people, while sometimes we were frustrated with them, they are our, they are bread and butter. They're changing these crazy bottles all the time. So they call us, they'll send us a bottle, they'll send us a sample, they'll send us a drawing. Hey, can you make me some quick change parts to run this package? I've got a new gig that we're gonna be releasing for the soccer, whatever, and I need it in four weeks. So very quick turnover for specialty packages and so, we use, the, these particular parts are made out of plastic, so we use routers to make the parts. We have two routers in Willoughby, and um, these parts are also susceptible to crashes. So when something goes wrong on the machine, these parts go crash, boom, and bend. And when they go crash, boom, and bend, it's pretty hard to kind of like fix them, so they need to buy new ones. So we need to have really quick emergency response to the customers for these kind of parts. We also need to be always looking at ways that they can get them on and get them off faster or have parts that can handle it all. Um, so that's two. The next part is the seaming division that I told you about in the small town right outside of Baltimore. Oh, good, thank you, sorry. <laughs> Are we ready for questions? Oh my gosh, <gasps> I'm two minutes over. Okay, we do seamers and we do blenders. Do you have any questions? <laughs> is one of your questions, what are blenders? <laughs> No, it's okay. It's really okay. Like, <laughs> thank you. Um, seriously, I'm excited to answer questions for you. So definitely like when you go through resumes, you can kind of pick up a lot of the technical. You can't really get it all from that. You do have to kind of get that out, out of the uh, interview, but definitely, for, especially for technical roles, really um, somebody who's curious and excited and can communicate well. Um, because it is so important for engineers to communicate across departments. And that's a little bit of a difficult skill to find because a lot of folks that are, um, and, and not to really stereotype, but to kind of stereotype, is they, they, they go into engineering because they like to do these things. They like to solve these problems on their own and they like to do these things like that. But those that are curious and want to work with other people and work in tandem on projects and, and be open to that, I would say definitely for technical people. Good question. Really, really good question and very important one.
So at that juncture, I, I mean, I could retire like in five years if I wanted to now, right? Um, I knew BevCorp because I was actually a customer to BevCorp. I made the cappers and, um, wait, I'm a supplier, I was a supplier. BevCorp was my customer anyway, so I would ship cappers over here. So I knew some of the folks, I knew the culture. I knew the business, I knew it was growing. Um, at this point in time, Alcoa sold CSI to uh, a private equity out of New Zealand, and they had been running it for a few years. And um, we were not in a growth mode. We were constantly in shrinking, 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 taking less risk, less out of the box thinking. I hadn't hired anybody in like three or four years. I loved to develop people. I didn't have, I had one person under 30 and she was a temp. And, um, you know, everybody's kind of hanging on because they, you know, is it going to be me this next go around, you know, the grim, grim reaper. And I always said I would rather be the person to deliver the bad news than somebody else. So I was like, OK with that. But when the BevCorp opportunity came and, and I got to see who they are, I mean, see even more than just knowing them um, in our in our business relationship, really get to know um, the owners and, uh, um, you know, the, the Itochu Corporation. Um, I'll show you a picture of that. But um, so, yeah, it was really it was really about the culture here and about the opportunity to grow and to really be who I am. So I like I like change. I like I like being able in, in it's not easy because I'm kind of going through what I did with the original growing pains of Alcoa back in the early 90s. Right. But but persevere through that and, and be creative. You know, I really miss being creative and developing young people, young, old, whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're doing something new. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and they haven't let me down at all. Never been a boring moment. <laughs> Good question. Oh my gosh, this one's so fun. Does it have to be work-related? I mean, sort of work-related. Why not both? Okay, it's, it's both. So, um, so we went, when I was in Russia, this is really funny, when, when we were in Russia, we got a little bit of downtime, but I had to take the crew, the service techs, so that they could, could see a little bit more of my, Russia. So we got to take the night train from Moscow to St. Petersburg. So we're on the night train, and you get your little cubicles and stuff, but they sell beer in the halls, and, and people are talking to each other. So, so I'm all excited to be able to translate and tell the service techs who, we're, who we're, we're with, you know? And so we meet these people, and we talk all night long on the train. We're talking to people. I met somebody who was going to their funeral in St. Petersburg, and somebody else was doing this or that. And um, so we got our wonderful experience in St. Petersburg. We got to meet young kids, old kids. And, Back at the train station, um, our guys, I, I don't know, they, they went away for a second, they were getting tickets, and I was kind of waiting by our train, and I was like sitting there, and this guy comes up to me, and he goes, I'm gonna say it in Russian. Yeah? piva. And I go, oh, okay. So I run to the corner, I get the six pack, and I sit down with him, and I tell him happy birthday, because he told me today was his birthday. So I'm sitting there telling him, you know, happy birthday, and we're cheering with the beer, and he starts to tell me these stories, he came there from Estonia, and his sister lived in Latvia, and they had millions of money. Blah, blah, blah. He's telling these stories, and I'm so excited because I understand every single story he's telling me, and I can't wait to tell my guys when they get back. And they go, who are you talking to? You're talking to this stranger, this homeless guy? He hit you up for beer? I was like, oh, I didn't really think about that. We're just having a great conversation. So that, that was pretty fun. That was definitely, I was just so excited that I could understand everything he said. <laughs> And the guys were just glad I was alive. <laughs> so, so that was fun. I'm sure there's others. I'm sure there's, we climbed down Machu Picchu at night because back then, um, so they, they shut it down at dusk. That was another one for another story. That's for a cookie. <laughs> another question. Great question. I love Mexico. I love the Mexican people. I love how they do business. I love working with the customers there. I love working with our service guys because they're flexible. So you talk about thinking on the fly. Um, there, we, we as Alcoa had more um, electrical mechanical techs in, in Mexico and in South America than we do in other countries. And I love that. Um, 
because they, they look at the problem a little more holistically and one person can do both, not just because of efficiency, but they just do a better job at it. And people in Mexico love to have fun. We laugh all the time. No matter how bad the problems are, we get back in the car and we all laugh about something. So that's, that's my number one. Um, I really love Russia. That's probably a close number two. Hungary is fascinating. It's, it's very interesting to do. We did business there also right after the wall came down. So we got to hang out in customs and just kind of watch those military customs people. They drink beer on, the, on, the after, on their breaks and you just wait. You just wait. You're at their, their beck and call. So, so that's was, that was pretty fascinating. Um, and I like, I like most of South America, yeah. I, I, think, I think what comes to mind immediately without really um, overanalyzing it is getting, getting good people, retaining good talent, and, and especially mechanical, electrical, especially technical, hands-on um, people. I think there's been a time where we were all shoved into universities or, you know, just took different paths, but I think getting good technical people with good problem-solving skills that, that can think a little out of the box could definitely do like five whys and good problem-solving. Yeah. Not the equipment, you can get equipment, you know. Man, that's a great question. Um, definitely getting that, that 200E capper done, the one that we started as a skunk squirk. When we got that thing rolling and to see that is the product they still sell today. To do that, other than the other engineers getting upset because we did it in a vacuum. <laughs> it was just so cool to watch, you know, we had a team of four, they had a day job too, but they would come and they would work on this on the weekend and they would buy aluminum parts and like cobble it together and this was, this was their solution. And to get that into the marketplace and it's still the product that we use, that, that Alcoa still uses today, I, I, that's probably, that, that's a pretty high one. I'm sure there's others. You know, they were very peaceful. Like we, we had to watch it a little bit in the parking lot, but they were very peaceful. It was a small shop, maybe 50 people, you know. You know what's so funny is when everybody got situated back in their place, I, I didn't know this at the time, but like, um, we would take paperwork back to shipping, right? Um, customer service was supposed to take it back, but I didn't know the girls weren't allowed to go back there. And I said, wait a minute, I was a girl a month ago and I was working back there and you're not letting me walk through the shop to take the paperwork back? And they go, no, it's just kind of like our policy. We just don't, you know, we just don't want you to do that. And I never got a good reason why, so I hardly ever got to see the shop people. Isn't that weird? I did get to see the shipping lady because she would come up. There was actually a shipping lady that worked on the shipping. So she would come up and pick up the international paper late, late in the day, but I never got to interact with the shop floor people. Yeah. I think that the production um, supervisors and managers, you know, I think everything kind of went back to normal and I don't know that there was any real rough or anything that I'm aware of, but really weird, right? Yeah. Okay.